Rock and Roll with Adam Fleming. And uh, we are excited to be able to bring you some value today. It's a two hour masterclass. The first hour will be with Adam Fleming. The second hour will be myself talking about marketing. So it's coaching meets marketing. Adam, can you see the screen? And um, are, are you? I don't see the slides yet. Okay, hold on one sec. Let me make sure and get that for you. Go back and get you the slides. There you are. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Fleming. Adam Fleming has been uh, the, one of the most influential people when it comes to helping us become more of a coaching organization, a coaching first organization. He's helped me personally, also our uh, tribe, our network of marketing professionals understand how to best ask those killer questions in order to be able to, to really help those conversations move along. So I wanna uh, encourage you to take a good close listen to what Adam's about to present today so that you can be a master of asking those questions. So Adam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, Timothy, thank you so much. Thank you and Stacy also for all your hard work in getting this thing ready to go. Um, just a little bit about me, you know, I even back in high school began to realize that I was, um, you know, love to encourage people. And I was just kind of like this wild encourager, kind of like a mad scientist, you know, with my hair all standing up on end and come on, let's go, you know, but not really any uh, discipline or not really knowing how to channel that, if you will. Um, sometime in my early 30s, uh, I went up to a guy that I worked with and I said, hey, would you consider being my mentor? And he said, no but I'll coach you. And I found that he was going through a professional coach training program at the time and needed some people to practice with. So I said, you know, I don't even know what the difference between mentoring and coaching is, but, but it sounds good. Let's try it. Um, what I discovered there was to add to that mad encourager, there was a methodology that anyone can learn, whether you're naturally encouraging or or, or not, um, but it is there, there are methods to how to coach people. Um, so I, add, I went through a training program, added that method to my madness, and um, fast forward another 12 years, and here we are. Uh, this is what I do now as I teach people how to listen better. Um, our company is called Motivational Listening International, and a little, few little factoids about me on the screen, but that's good. Um, I want to start by talking about whether you're a coach, whether you're in marketing, or whether you're doing any any number of other services that you provide. Um, maybe you're you're. I, I saw a variety of different things, so it's all good. Um, a lot of us we have businesses where client retention is gold, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, before we dive into some some uh, listening skills, um, because it's very easy especially for me. I mean, this is what I had to learn because I would talk too much because I was a mad encourager. Um, so that would be kind of my, my thing. So Jack Welch said that in the future, people who are not coaches will not be promoted. And I don't know if he only meant that for people in GE or if that's a, a broad statement, but I think it is now uh, a broad statement um, that Really, if you want to be promoted or whether you own your company or not, you want to promote yourself, right, to another raise or to another uh, level of, uh, um, well, let's say it's a promotion if you have uh, less work to do in a given week. That's another way to give yourself a promotion. Um, I still believe that this is true. So <clears throat> this is kind of my, my thing is if you own some kind of service providing business, Client retention is equivalent to a promotion. It's going to supply your year-end bonus. Just think about that. I mean, you know, that's what it's all about. Well, we got one other thing that it's about, but primarily what I'm talking about today is client retention. Well, that requires quality. So <clears throat> what we do is we help people get better at, at listening. So if you take a, if you do the math here a little bit, two leadership coaches, and I know not everyone here is a leadership coach. That's fine. Take anybody in your industry, acquire one new client per month, and you can see the numbers there. If pro provider one has a three-month average retention and provider two has a six-month average retention, provider one's sample um, is there is 
the end of year two, their gross is 63,000. And the end of year two <clears throat> is uh, 144 for provider number two, just because of that doubling of the average retention of a client. Um, and slight addition in there as well is getting a couple more referrals than provider number one. All that based on being a better listener, being better at it. Um, I had an experience. I was talking with a colleague last month. Um, his name is Steve. And he said, hey, I'll probably let my coach go soon. I've heard all of his stories more than once. And uh, I said, you know, Steve, coaching really isn't about him telling his stories, right? And he said, yeah, I know. So if you think that your coaching is going to incre increase retention by telling your stories, you're dead wrong. Um, people like this guy are going to say, now I've got all your stories. You're really not creating any, providing any new value. The value comes through listening, not through telling your stories. And it's not about creating dependence. It's about providing continuing value. So you need to tell your story initially. Yeah, of course. And then you need to draw out the client's story because that is what's continuing to develop in your relationship is the client's story. All right, so I'm gonna give you a snippet of the training. Uh, uh, we have a 60 hour program. This is a less than an hour uh, snippet of what we do, but this is crucial. Timothy mentioned a couple of times in the introduction, asking better questions. Well, you can't ask better questions if you don't listen first. If you've, if you've ever watched Columbo or any detective show, really, you know that the detectives have to listen, they have to observe, they have to, they have to think, and they have to ask questions, but they have to observe first. Um, so listening is really what we're going to talk about today. It's all about observing. All right. So the target is an acronym, and the T, the first T stands for transitions. So as I'm listening to somebody to share their story with me, what's going on in their lives today, or maybe I'm meeting them for the first time and they're telling me, uh, you know, a 10-minute version of their life story, which is great, I'm listening for transitions and taking note of those things because those are important parts of people's lives. So I'm using the group of grapes as my vision visualization for tr transition because grapes don't ripen overnight. It takes them a couple of weeks to go from green to purple or whatever color they're supposed to be. Uh, so that's a process. It's not something that happens immediately. And that's important. Can you give us an example of maybe a transitional like question? Uh, sure. Um, well, somebody might say, during my college years, I thought I was going to be a doctor. Um, and as I went through college and realized that chemistry was really hard and so on and so forth, I realized that I was better suited to being an artist instead. <laughs> and so there's a transition period time there that you, that you heard where they're kind of giving you clues that it took a while for that realization to happen. But it's an important part of their process of how their, their life developed. So that's really kind of what you're looking for in the transition is the fact that they're telling you something changed me, something happened there. That might give you a clue to ask a question about. Okay, the A in, in the target acronym stands for asymmetry. And I think this one is particularly interesting when you talk about intercultural or cross-cultural <clears throat> intergenerational conversations is the idea of asymmetry is the person says one thing and they say another thing and they don't line up. You, you don't quite understand how they connect. Now, everybody's got a reason for what they're talking about so it makes sense in their heads, but as you're listening, you're still going, I'm not sure how that piece, the, the smoking gun in, you know, in the Columbo show, and what's the next one? There's a smoking gun. Hit the next slide for me, would you? And, and yet you're also finding poison, right? So the detective is going, We've got two possibilities here, and I'm not sure how they're connected, but they're both in the same room. So the asymmetry idea is listening for things that don't make sense to you, at least not yet. When you find those things, when you uncover it, you said there's a smoking gun, but there was also a poison dart frog in the room. 
I'm still trying to figure those out, you can ask a good question about that. But and the reason I say in cross cultural contexts or intercultural contexts can be really powerful is different cultures have different sets of common senses. So they may be assuming the speaker may be assuming that you know it make, what makes sense about it, um, and you just don't yet. So it's it's a touch point for a question. So I think many times we we try to um, pretend like we know what somebody's saying just mm -hmm. to kind of be kind or. Mm -hmm. or or, or, or not be rude in some ways, but you're saying, Hey, make sure you have the dots connected. Make sure, right. make sure there's some, there's, there's good questions being asked. So you can be that detective and go deeper on mm -hmm. things that aren't quite making sense, whether it's a cross-cultural uh, uh, yeah. disparity or whether it's just plain old communication and with somebody in your own space, right. like, right. can you explain that a little bit more for me? I'm trying to connect the dots here. Is that what you're talking yeah. about, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you're asking the exact kind of questions that you would want to ask when something doesn't quite make sense yet. So we're so meta, man. We're well so demonstrated. Meta. That's it. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. It. Exactly. So I think you got it. Yeah. Um, and and that is the trickiest one of these six. So feel free to you know send me a message on LinkedIn later and say, hey, explain asymmetry to me, you know, in more depth. But you know, then we have repetition. Um, so if you hear me say asymmetry 20 times you know that it's probably pretty important to me. <laughs> if you hear me say, um, you know, uh, the car broke down yesterday five times, you know, it was probably a pretty important part of my day yesterday. So whatever someone repeats, whether it's just an item, a fact, or, or an emotion, or whatever it might be, you can pretty well guarantee that that's a good clue that they're telling you something's important about that. Okay? Was, that one's um, pretty like that one's, just it was it was i love the fact that and, when you're talking about detective work you're um, literally using the word clue mm -hmm. <laughs> so so yes. you're finding those clues right is that what you're saying right the the listening target really is a target full of clues um these are these are six things that i'm listening for and there are others but they're a nice handle to get Look, people often say you got to be a top, you got to be a, an active listener or a better listener or increase your listening skills. And nobody ever tells you how. So that's what I'm going after here is how do you become a better listener? Well, you've got to have some things to listen for. Otherwise, you think that everything is worth the same. And not every word gets the same number of points. If you've ever played Scrabble, you know that. So, okay. So here we go. The gut is the person, the speaker's instinct or their intuition somehow. Now you'll hear, you might hear um, religious people say, well, I felt like God told me this. You might hear a religious people say the universe told me this, or I just had a feeling that I ought to go talk to her, or I just knew somehow, I don't know how I knew it, but that's their gut. Now you also use your own gut in, in listening when you get to, um, deciding what kind of question to ask. Let's say you hear all six of these things and you know, I gotta ask a question about one of them. You're gonna have to use your own intuition somewhat, but that's not really what we're talking about here in gut. We're talking about listening for their comments that are telling you that they had some kind of instinctive sense about the situation. Um, okay, good enough on that. I already mentioned emotions when we were talking about repetition. So, uh, emotions can, uh, and this isn't only negative, which is why I've got a guy smiling there on the screen. Um, if someone tells you that they were very happy with your service, that might be a good time to ask them for a referral. <laughs> if you're listening, if you're paying attention to the emotions, uh, both positive and negative and confused, mixed, um, those, those are places where you can ask a better question when you hear emotional words come up. And the final one in the listening target is turning points. So this is different from transitions. Um, somebody once asked me, like, isn't that pretty much the same thing? Well, it is, but it isn't. And why, you know, why do you have both of them in there? And I said, well, target has two T's in it. So I had to do something. But um, the idea of a turning point, you know, if, if you're, if you're familiar um, with Christian literature, you know about Paul's Damascus Road experience, but it, well, everybody knows about that. It's like that turning point, that 
sudden realization. It's not a transition that takes five months. It's like that one day you woke up, <laughs> you had a dream, you woke up and you said, I must start my own business. And you started before the afternoon because you had a turning point that day. And Is it like a defining moment? Is it like a defining moment? Different? Like kind of at least my, micro epic, at least, right? Micro epic, crystal clear, like just a, it, it may go along with one of those gut things. Like I just realized I had to do something different. Uh, it's just something told me that I had to, I, I had to get out and start walking five miles a day or I was going to die of a heart attack. So and I've the never been day, the same since. And I've never been the same since all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's, right. that's the turning point. And they're letting you know that something pretty important happened in their lives. Um, if we're listening for the changes, you know, or the potential for change in people, uh, we can sell them something. We can help. We can help them sell themselves something. There's a lot of things you can do when you actually listen for these kind of six items. Well, change is uncomfortable, right? So you can you can yeah. help help someone feel bold or strong or find mm -hmm. a solution for whatever that is, if people feel like they're actually being heard. Right. We know the old adages. We can go into all that yeah. stuff another time. But the point is, is these are, man, these are great, Adam. These are this great. is how you support people, right? So I will tell a story here just to give you a little bit, let you get to know me a little bit better. But that's not the only reason. I want to give you some practice because everything I do, whether it's a master class like this or a, a long-term training, I always try to have some kind of experiential Thing going on so you can actually learn it you have to practice these six things and you got to practice them over and over but we're going to do one here so i will tell a story and you see if you can find all six of these items in there and um don't put them all in the chat right away while i'm talking but but later on we'll we'll give you a little opportunity to give feedback and see if you can get them all all right so here we go so i finished my uh professional coach training in 2009 and one of my first opportunities was with an organization that that does coaching for people around the world um, <clears throat> in living in cross-cultural, intercultural settings. And they assigned me to someone, and mind you, I was about 33, 33 years old at the time. No, 35, 35 years old. I hadn't ever led anything. And they assigned me to do some leadership coaching for a guy who'd been in his leadership position for 20 years and had... Uh, more than a thousand people working under him in his organization. And as we began our coaching process, um, I was trying to build rapport and I really stuck my foot in my mouth. <laughs> and he was telling me about some really difficult situations that he had dealt with at, um, in an intercultural setting. And I said, you know, um, I was in Congo when I was 13 years old and I saw some people um, you know, protesting and rioting and some things like that. And so I kind of know what you're talking about. Well, he was talking about getting thrown in jail himself. So he was talking about getting beaten himself. And he started screaming at me through the phone line. You have no idea what my life has been like. And this is, this is pre-Zoom, right? This is when you did, did um, coaching on the phone. And I was just kind of like, Oh boy, wow, I really screwed this up. So I, I called up my supervisor and I said, well, I got a problem. And fortunately she lives in the same town as me. And we met downtown, we had coffee together and she, I explained the whole thing to her. And I said, man, I really messed that up. And she said, Adam, what, what do you got to do? And I said, well, I mean, first, obviously I, I said something that offended him. I got to apologize and that's no fun, but I'll do it. And she said, great, that's, that's cool. Um, what else do you need to do? And I said, well, I could probably need to ask him if he would like to be assigned to a different coach in your organization, because this may have just like, may not be reparable, may not be something we can really move on from. And that's fine with me if that's what we got to do. And she said, great. So go ahead and do those two things. And I said, man, Tina, I just don't know if I can do this. I just went through a year of training, but I really screwed up my first client. And she said, Adam, you know, you've been through some really good training and you have a really good heart. You can't quit now. <laughs> and that was where I learned from Tina that the principle that I had learned that was, has to do with believing in people that she was applying to me 
I had heard people talk about it, but I'd never had someone believe in me the way she was doing at that moment. And so um, obviously, uh, without that story in 2009, I don't know if I'd be sitting here talking to you today about these kind of things. So that's the end of my story. Now, um, I want to give you a chance to just kind of throw in the chat, um, you know, put the either repetition or gut or emotions or something. Um, what did you hear in the story and just kind of throw it out there and see if we can find all six of them? Who heard okay. what? Give us one or two words that yeah, yeah. That would Along indicate with, one of the targets. Yeah, if you say emotions, give us an emotional word, like the specific word that I said, or um, if you can, like what was the actual word or phrase that I, that I said to kind of evidence what you did. Stacy, when you're looking through those responses, mm -hmm. I'm curious, yeah. uh, Adam, I'm sure Adam would be curious. I don't know uh, if I can do it. Yeah. Stacy's looking at them, but uh, I'm, we'd be curious of which ones are the most frequent as far as uh, each, each one of these uh, key points here. Are they coming in mm -hmm. um, with certain amount of volume as far as certain words or which ones are most, mm -hmm. most common? Are you asking me? A lot of emotions, fear, mm -hmm. guts, turning point. Mm -hmm. Turning point. Nancy says uh, transition in 2009, turning point when she believed when she believed in you. That's what she heard. Mm -hmm. Big turning point when she believed in me. Good, good catch there. Yep. Listening. Doubt. There's some doubt there. I mm -hmm. heard doubt as well. Doubt is kind of gut and emotion, right? I mean, it's kind of, it, it sort of bridges the gap between those. It's a feeling, but it's also like, hmm, can I do this? Yeah, that's a good one. Yep. And then um, I'm not sure who water is, but we have somebody by the name of water here. And then it's saying, uh, I have had a year of training. I just messed up my client. So when you said that, that was the emotion, the feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the year of training is kind of re, 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 referring to a transition period, for sure. I went from not knowing anything about this to I'm supposed to be good at it now, <laughs> and then, but I'm not, <laughs> you know. So it's a reference to a transition period, for sure. All right, Stacy, here's a question yeah. for you. Uh, which, which words uh, have, are not as, as high volume? Like, have, have people been using... Asymmetry, repetition, are those coming up frequently as well in the chat box? No, not yet. Adam, can you give us some exp some examples of uh, at least, you know, basic concepts around maybe sure. a little bit of repetition or asymm asymmetry in the story you just told? Um, I didn't work from a script this time. So if it was super scripted, I would have repeated like angry or disappointed or frustrated or something more times. Got so okay. they, they might not be catching it because it might not have been there as much, which right. is fine. I mean, it's sometimes it's good training to like not have it there and you're looking for it, but at least you're looking for it, right? The asymmetry, I have to say, that's the one that I can never, because that's about what they're hearing I heard this and I heard this and I wasn't sure how they fit together. The problem is I'm the speaker, so I know how it all fits. It all makes sense to me. So the asymmetry would completely come from the audience and not from me. I, I couldn't tell you what might Got be it. asymmetrical for people. That makes sense. Okay, good, good. So we've covered all of them mm -hmm. uh, in the chat box. And then we, we, we kind of mentioned the other two here that, that weren't quite as frequent. Very mm -hmm. good. Thank you, Adam, for that exercise. Cool. Let's see what we got next here. All right. We'll give people a challenge. So take this home. Uh, hopefully you've taken notes on the tar what the six target items are. So practice it with five people next week. You don't have to tell them that you're practicing it. You just got to listen better. Um, and then if you want to make a response, I'm going to give you a super canned response because we don't have time to talk about how to ask better questions. So you could do this. You mentioned put in the exact word or phrase that they said, don't change it. If they said they were angry, don't say mad. I mean, I know that's a really small difference, but use the exact word. You said you were angry. You mentioned you were angry. Say more about that and just invite them to talk more about the thing that you thought might be important in what they said. All those target items are important. So you got to maybe have to pick one, but that's your challenge. Um, your takeaway. If you want to get better at this, try it five times in the next week. 
So we can try this with our significant others, with our family yeah. members, with our coworkers, coworkers, just to kind of practice first. Person you just met. Okay. All right. So, so even yeah. like in the grocery stores or anywhere we're going, like you can literally just pick up some cues from conversations and then go ahead and just ask them this. This almost feels like a, is it a type of active listening? Is that what you're kind of? Yeah, is this it, is. This is what people are talking about when they say active listening. And if you've always wondered, well, what does that mean? I'm trying to give you some how handles and not just the what. Got it. Because active listening is a thing that we all have heard of. But how do you do it? Here's, you know, six handles to grab that mug by. Come on. I like it. I like it, Adam. Well, good. I know that you've helped. Uh, yes. Troy, you know, Troy says it's mirroring and that's exactly what I would call it in, in our, in our longer training, we would call this a mirroring, mirroring exercise. Well, mirroring, active listening, mirroring kind of thing going on. But right? pick out those six because though you can mirror everything somebody says, but that doesn't necessarily mean you've picked out something important. These are the important things that they're saying. And so mirror one of those and see what happens. Love it. Love it. Good. Yeah, if we had more time. Well, this is what we do. Um, you know, learning to ask better questions, for sure. Um, learning to help people reframe their situation, learning to stay curious, learning to improvise, learning to communicate interculturally. Those are all sort of the kind of things that we, we teach at Motivational Listening International. I will have to say this on a personal note. Adam is a master of reframing a conversation in a healthy way. In other words, you know, there's a way to reframe a conversation for like personal gain or manipulation or different things like this. But if you want to get deeper into some of these nuances, definitely connect with Adam on LinkedIn or or hit. hit I think you're going to make a, a, an opportunity for people to be able to, to stay connected with you. Right, Adam? Yeah, well, I'm realizing we're only half past the hour. So we blew through that slideshow, but we can leave some some time for some Q&A here mm -hmm. since we do have an hour. So um, what is my LinkedIn? Um, Stacy, can you throw that in there for me? That would be super helpful. Um, I think actually we've got it in the next slide too. But um, yeah, so we have a basic coach training course. It's pretty intense. It's 60 hours. It takes about five months. You do not have to necessarily be on your way to becoming a certified professional coach, you could take it just because you know, as a leader in your organization, you need to listen better and you need to ask better questions and we can help you get there. You don't have to go on to get, uh, you know, certified by the International Coach Federation or anything if you don't want to. Um, we do have an intercultural communi communication uh, unit that I teach, uh, I co-teach with um, an expert from Cairo. Uh, he's an Egyptian national who's lived interculturally in Sudan and uh, maybe some other places too. So you're not just getting like the North American white male voice on what intercultural communication is. Um, not that that's worthless, but it's it's important to us that we have multiple voices there. And then we also have some fun stuff that we do with people um, for improvisation. We use improv games. Um, so that's one of the things that we do also. Stacy, you had something? Thank you. Um, we have Troy that would like to say something. So I just wanted to make sure that we put, put that in there. Troy, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sure. I just had a question on uh, intercultural communication because I had a, a recent episode. I ended up firing a client, you know, um, mm -hmm. but um, I'm a very direct communicator and I'm very systematic. Um, I live off the calendar, you know, things of that nature. And yeah. finding anyone outside, not anyone, but a lot of people outside of our culture don't make the meetings or they're an hour late or you tell them something and their project manager is not understanding it. You give mm -hmm. detailed information and it seems to be a bit of a mess, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even even um, um, clarity for payment issues that are spelled out. Um, what are like. I don't know, three tips to kind of reframe it or restructure it where you can have less of those issues. Because my solution was not to deal with certain type of people and, and move mm -hmm. on with the people that kind of make more sense for me because I was highly mm -hmm. frustrated, you know, and mm -hmm. it cost me, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. trying to uh, provide value, but not being taken for a ride, you know? 
Yeah, one of the things that we were talking about recently in our intercultural communication course was about how, um, and particularly because I've lived cross-culturally, just uh, actually just came back during uh, the beginning of COVID from living in Cairo, Egypt. And one of the things that we were talking in our class recently is how there's different things in the business community from the social community, even in a place like Cairo. And, and that's my frame of reference. So I, but I understand the difference between like direct communication culture and indirect. Um, but part of what I think is happening as we have this internet allowing us to connect with clients all over the globe is that business is becoming its own kind of culture. So even in a place like Cairo, where it used to be that maybe showing up for a meeting 30 minutes late was not a big deal, now the business community is like expecting to do business with the rest of the world and even internally in a different way than, than they might use in their social calendar, for example. Um, so one of my first thoughts, Troy, is it's possible that it just wasn't a great fit for you. Um, just because they weren't giving you the respect that business culture in general is starting to like acknowledge around the world. On the other hand, uh, intercultural communication, and I have to tell you, like the other guy that I work with is a little bit more of an expert on this stuff than me. Um, I don't think Sam is here today, but um, on the other hand, getting some training around how to deal with indirect culture communicators could be helpful the next time you have something like that. And that's an actual term, right, Adam? It's an indirect culture paradigm, right? It's not in, indirect it's communication. It's not just a phrase, right? No, yeah, it's it's absolutely a thing that some cultures are more, more uh, direct communicating and other cultures are more indirect communicating, but it doesn't mean that the message can't get across. Um, and it doesn't mean that there isn't a way to, to make that happen. Yeah, I remember um, your associate you, Sam was just lights out awesome on that. Yeah, so. he's really good on this stuff. And so I, I, I kind of have to say maybe some of those questions I'd have to defer a little bit to, you know. But I also think that sometimes when you're just not getting paid or people just aren't showing up, there is the question of whether or not they value what you do. And yeah. that- I appreciate probably, it, Adam. I think that, you've done yeah. a pretty good job. I came to the conclusion, you know, that when I have to, if I have to ask the ask, ask a client, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, because of payment methods and they're getting results, they mm -hmm. have some other fundamental business issues um, right. um, that are happening. Right. And so I could, I could cry over spilled milk, mm -hmm. you know, or I could just understand what it is and then move on for mm -hmm. the future to do mm -hmm. better, you know, for the future. And mm -hmm. to, to be honest with you, half the problem's me. You know, I selected that client and sure. I have to take responsibility for selecting that client, you know, and then have a maybe better vetting process. But I just found out a lot of times, you know, if I'm speaking to you, Adam, maybe mm -hmm. for some business thing or whatever, um, you're pretty direct because you need a solution. So mm -hmm. you're gonna tell me your pain you're mm -hmm. going to tell me what's working and you're going to tell me what's not working, you know, mm -hmm. versus uh, something that Timothy has brought up as far as indirect communication. They may not want to 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 provide that to you. And then that may lead you to astray, you know, so mm -hmm. I have to be a better judge of um, who to deal with as and on the other side, I may have to just understand how to dig deeper into the conversation to pull the right information out or mm -hmm. if it's worth it or not. Adam, yeah, would sure. you say well, that, would you say that this kind of conversation, well, first of all, Troy, it's super helpful for everybody, but yeah. would, would you say that this kind of conversation and, and this kind of training is really best utilized for somebody who has the level of self-awareness mm -hmm. that Troy has right now? Like, like you can't just jump into this target mm -hmm. method of listening yeah. and really, really engage with somebody right. if all you're trying to do is sell them a widget. You know what I mean? Like you, right. if, if you really care and you have self-awareness, others' awareness, emotional intelligence, now you're in the game. That's the big boy and big girl game, right? Well, here's the main thing that Troy said that, that gives me a ton of hope for you, Troy, is half the problem is with me. <laughs> you can't go into intercultural communication with the mentality that all the problem is 
them. You know, if you have that kind of humility to say, I'm a, I want to learn to communicate better interculturally, you almost have to approach it saying, I'm going to take at least as much responsibility for this going well as, as I want them to take. So that was kudos to you, Troy, just for articulating like it, half of it's on me, you know, like, and whether it's choosing the client or whether the communication itself is half of that's on you as well. So um, this well may said. be a, a slightly different, slightly different topic, but I've noticed even uh, with uh, dealing with clients, um, men are harder to see certain details than females and I'm not trying to be sexist against men or anything like that, but mm -hmm. Uh, even in conversations that a lot of times since I have an engineering background, I have to work harder because I don't see certain cues. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have a meeting uh, with someone and they'll agree with me and they'll go forward to it. And then someone else will say, hey, Troy, she she really this was really what she was saying. I said, no, she didn't say that at all. <laughs> and I won't see it, you mm -hmm. know, so having uh, uh, paying attention to the little cues it's not natural for a lot of people and it takes right. a lot of work. Well, and that's, thank you for saying it's not natural. Cause that's the whole concept of those, um, you know, the, the target items is like, here's six things that you don't naturally listen for at a heightened level. Um, but if you do, you can pick up things, whether it's male, female, whether it's just different personality types, I don't know exactly. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to speak to it right now, but, um, but the, you're right. These things are not natural. And that's, that's why I bother training people on them. Thanks, Troy. It really, it, that was good. I wonder if anybody else has some other questions. I don't know if you can hear me. This is Dawn Marie Borsico. Yep. I like what you've been sharing and what you've talked about as far as communication and listening. And I think the key thing that you stated was humility. Uh, mm -hmm. we are going to hear on the basis of our own personal lives and our own business lives, our own educational lives, the, where we live, what we're filtered through our beliefs. And when we come to any situation from a place of humility of understanding, okay, let me get out of my own ethnocentric world right. and begin to say, okay, others have a different experience than me. Right. And then to begin to rephrase, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. When you say that, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when people speak, I will see in pictures or they'll say mm -hmm. one thing, but I'll look at their body language and their body language says I'm broken. I don't understand. And you get the fact that they're putting on a front. And then I think mm -hmm. the second thing is understanding our own and when I say biases, I don't mean anything negative, right. but if we already come into a, a situation where I just don't like something or I perceive something a certain way, we, we, we need to ask that question, well, why do you see it that way? Mm -hmm. And when we understand in psychodynamic, uh, psychodynamic leadership talks about understanding kind of like our own demons, understanding our own our own challenges. And when we understand what we're bringing to the table, it allows us to give others that we're listening to and trying to assist a lot more grace, a lot more times of understanding. So mm -hmm. based points, on what you were sharing points, with your humility, I think any, that that any makes question, a difference. Any question for Adam at this point? That Those are really good points. Don Marie, no. do you have any questions? I, I'm not sure if there's a question, but I appreciate the comments. And I no, no, no up. question. I just wanted to just give kudos, I guess, to uh. what he was saying in the areas of humility. That mm -hmm. was just key. And when he was saying about the man not understanding and sometimes we see things different, just those kudos on that and the ability to ask those additional questions and to start with ourselves and then understand and then moving out from there, what we do or don't understand to really allow others to be more transparent in what they want to say. Yeah. Yeah. So the humility thing is the problem is that you stop listening the minute you think you know what the answer is. So that's the arrogance, right? That's the hubris of, I already know the answers. I already got this down. 
why is this person even still talking? <laughs> right? Because I'm done listening. So you have to have humility to listen because you have to accept the fact that you may not have all the answers yet. And you're not going to listen if you think you have the answers. Well said, Don Marie. Hey, Thank quick you. question for you on that one, Adam. What if you do kind of have, I mean, have a level of expertise or have an answer that would be pretty obvious? Mm -hmm. it, when, when is it appropriate to kind of make a suggestion or give advice when you're in the middle of, of, of really the art and science of coaching? It's, it's, it's very different, right? I mean, how, yeah. how, do, how do we know? Right. Well, experience, practice, <laughs> training, um, there is a time and place for sharing your advice or for sharing your wisdom or expertise or knowledge. Um, no question about it. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have disciplines like mentoring in the world. And so um, I don't know, uh, there's no like super easy answer for when it's appropriate. It's all contained within any particular one-to-one -one or one-to-group relationship. So, um, so if it's a yeah. coaching kind of environment, Mm -hmm. Would it be safe to say, tell me if I'm off here, would it be safe to say that you should at least ask for permission to give yeah. advice? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, you've, you've been taking my training course. I, I have. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going all in, buddy. I, I love the course, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Any other questions as we kind of start landing the plane here or circling the runway? Nancy, go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Hello. So I think that this is great. And what I'm, I'm, and I'm willing to take it on. I like the idea that you gave me things to look for. So the success coach that likes results, I'm like, oh, good. Mm -hmm. And the space that I'm in right now is, I'm not sure if I was listening better for the right things. Now that you've given me the the six things to look for, mm -hmm. it, like now I'll, it, it's almost like the, the puzzle and the, the game and looking for the thing instead of being authentically with you sharing the story and being really mm -hmm. over there with you. I'm mm -hmm. more over here looking to find and check off the boxes. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just because it's something new, but I just kind of mm -hmm. want to get a little feedback on that. Oh, that's a great question. So I would say it is a, a way of giving yourself, like you said, a checklist. Um, I mean, obviously that's an exercise, you know, now that I've been doing this for 12 years, I don't sit there with a checklist going, you know, where's the emotion? Well, you know, it's like a, um, it's a little bit like doing drills on a soccer field or something. And the kids are saying, well, how's come we never shooting? You know, well, you have to learn to pass first. And then you use the cones and you use the, you know, the, the little things out there to give you guidance. And then eventually you just kind of, that just is part of the flow. Um, and so, yeah, um, you're a success coach. And so you're always driving towards results. And I think um, one of the <laughs> things about this target model is, you can be looking for areas where deeper transformation could be happening. And so it's almost like taking us a, a little bit of a step back of where's the success or how can I nail this into an action step in the next five minutes and more like, how can I really just be here alongside this person and hear them? So it's exactly what you're saying is that's what it's for is to be alongside that person. Just listening. It's just giving you some handles or, or it's like putting out the cones for the kids on the soccer field. And then eventually you don't need them anymore. So practice not with my clients, but practice with the friends and family. <laughs> oh, well, why not both? You know, I mean, like it, it wouldn't hurt. It'll just ra you raise your awareness of it enough to then when you hear a client, you know, say something, you'll be like, oh, that's an interesting. You just identified an emotion there and I'm going to ask a question about it. So, yeah, good, good, good question, Nancy. Adam, follow up question on that. Um, is it fair to say that many of us have a natural ability to at least kind of lean towards one of these target pieces. Like we, like, I know I pick up repetition mm -hmm. pretty, pretty, pretty naturally, but the rest I need to work on a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. So is that generally the case with folks you're training? Do, do they generally have like a natural ability to pick up certain cues, but then mm -hmm. have to practice other ones or how does that work? 
Yeah, I mean, when we do something we call a, an observed coaching session where they coach each other and I'm just observing the coach doing the coaching, um, sometimes I'll find things like and in the debrief afterwards, I'll say, oh, you know, it's the, your client mentioned this feeling and I, 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 I noticed that you didn't ask them about it or whatever. And I don't assume that they missed it. Um, but that sometimes they respond and say, oh, yeah, I totally missed that word completely or, you know, whatever. And then sometimes they say, I didn't miss it. I just chose not to ask about it. And that's I mean, this is all we have conversations. We don't it's not about doing it right or wrong. It's doing it better and best. We have another question in the chat box here from Anthony Marquez. I hope I said your last name right. Could you possibly speak to preferred method of reframing conversation or an example of a reframe? Sure. Um, I'll give you an example because I think that's probably the best way to go about it. Uh, this morning, um, I was observing one guy coaching another as part of the training process. And one of his comments had something to do with um, how permanent is this decision? And it reminded me of uh, something I saw recently from Jeff Bezos talking about how some doorways are two way and some doorways are one way. And so what he was doing was really bringing in what I would call a universal life principle and saying, here's a principle that how does it relate to your situation would be the he didn't ask it that way. But, you know, we had a good conversation about how to ask it better. But really what he did was bring in a reframe in the sense of the client was thinking, every decision I make here in this situation is huge and life-changing and, you know, and he was like, basically reframing it to, well, is that reversible? It had to do with which uh, school to send a kid to. Well, you could send a kid to school for a semester and realize it's not working out. And, you know, that is a reversible. So he reframed it in the sense of how permanent is this? Um, and, it really helped the client a lot because it, it uh, get, gave them a different perspective on it. Does reframing often include like analogies and story? Like how, do, how does that like? Yeah, what is, metaphors, you... um, analogies, sometimes a story, although we work pretty hard on keeping those short stories short, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of different ways to reframe. Anything else pop up, Stacy? Anybody else have a question? You can definitely put it in the chat box and Stacy will monitor that for us. We, You're also we, welcome to raise your hand if you if you if you like to verbalize. Yeah, for sure. Um, Robert, I don't know if you want to verbalize your question there. It was it kind of got lost in the thread. It's a little bit hard to follow that, but if you want to verbalize it, go ahead, please. Okay. So here's the situation. A uh, business associate and I share a client. Um, mm -hmm. We are both independent contractors. We're not employed or anything like that. We're working for a client independently. Sure. We have very, very extreme views on COVID. Uh huh. Um, to the point where we can't even work together because mm -hmm. you know unless i wear a hazmat suit into the building uh <laughs> you know i'm not welcome yeah and and they are on the other extreme where you know they are masked constantly yeah. um and 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 even though the building's policy the client's policy does not require the masks this this consultant is making it very impossible for all of us to work together um and I don't know how to diffuse that. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it's like it's escalating beyond, you know, anything mm -hmm. reasonable. And the client may ultimately fire them or fire me. <laughs> one, one or the other. I mean, you know, uh, because at the end of the day, we can't, yeah, we can't perform the functions for which we are required to perform, right? Uh, to help the client. Yeah. And, you know, I've suggested that the person just zoom into all the meetings and that would be perfectly appropriate because mm -hmm. uh, then they don't have to be present physically and they can still do their work. Because yeah. there are many hands-on things that I need to do because I need to meet with people 
you know, personally in the building, but not. Mm -hmm. Robert, can you rephrase the question in a really short, like what's the, let's, the, what's the, the key? How do, I, how do I diffuse the situation with, the, with a colleague that I'm mm -hmm. required to do business with when mm -hmm. that colleague has such extreme views from mine as to appropriate behavior yeah uh that it prevents us from working in the same building together <laughs> well said well said thank you yeah good thanks robert it's good to see you um again and uh the what a tough tough question um i'll just be transparent like my wife does not want me to get vaccinated and i want to get vaccinated so it's an issue in my marriage right now so i totally feel you <laughs> It's, it's not fun, uh, what we're going through as a society right now. And um, it is, we were on a six hour drive yesterday together and just talking about how, you know, what we're learning, we've been learning from Sam as we talk more about intercultural communication and how we have different sets of common sense. So what makes sense to your business partner doesn't make sense to you. And what makes sense to you doesn't make sense to him or her, and, and therefore you're in this kind of intercultural um, headbutting thing. And what we realized was really it's, it's not about like, do you trust the CDC or not? Is almost like the most baseline question is what information that you can get out there do you trust and what do you not trust? And so I don't know if this will help or not, Robert, honestly, because now here I am giving advice after just listening for a minute, which is exactly what I never do. But one question I would suggest is, how can we figure out uh, what we can both trust in common? That would, be the, that would be the question maybe to start with. How can we figure out what, what you can trust and I can also trust? How can we find that common ground and then see where you can go from there? Adam, that's a super interesting uh, recommendation as far as how to approach, you know, the questions and conversations, mm -hmm. because whether it's political differences, ge geographical differences, opinion difference, like it, whatever it is, uh, this can be extremely valuable. And when we're coaching or asking questions mm -hmm. to power partners, team members, clients, the art of this art of asking really relevant and common mm -hmm. connecting questions Yeah, where you're bringing the emotional connection and the trust level mm -hmm. to a whole nother place is outrageously valuable. And what we've seen effects in our business to, to, to that, that, that are just super, super surprising. I didn't realize honing in these coaching skills would be so impactful. I, I, I didn't, mm -hmm. I, I knew I wanted to hang out with you and do some more of these kind of things together. I just didn't realize how much impact it was going to have on our team culture, our company, mm -hmm. our experience, our brand, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but man, thank you so yeah. much for making yourself available. We have time for maybe like one quick question, Stacy. Is there anything in the chat box? Or are we are we landing the plane here? We we kind of need to land the land the plane here and keep going on with um with the marketing aspect of this. But Troy, your question about um having like being able to explain a different situation, I welcome you to connect with Robert, and you guys can maybe vent like have some conversation about that. Unless there's we, something like kind of really short and sweet, quick, we kind of need to keep going here. We love networking. Um, that's how Timothy and I got connected. One of us reached out to the other on LinkedIn, said, hey, can we have a short conversation? Um, I don't remember who reached out to whom, but uh, anyway, yeah, if you'd like to set a meeting and chat with me for a few minutes, there's the, there's the link. And I'm looking forward to introducing Timothy Morgan to you at the beginning of our next hour. This is gonna be fun, ladies and gentlemen. So let's take a, a quick break. As, as many of us around here like to say, let's just, just take a short break and either pray or do whatever we do. No, I'm just kidding. No, let's take a, let's take a bio break and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. All right.
So for anyone who might have popped on a little bit after, please, like Tamiki says in the chat, pop your um, LinkedIn in there and go ahead and connect and make some new connections, meet some new people. That's what we're all here for and that's what we're excited to do. So we're well, a few more minutes there and we'll come back into the room and uh, get going with Timothy Morgan. I wanna make sure that we have time for questions and answers as well, because we have a lively group and I love it. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably just, let's just rock and roll here in the next probably 30 seconds. You got it. That sounds great, that sounds great. Well, Adam, if you could, you know, chime in and let's have some conversation around these principles. You I bet. know you and I have been planning on this for quite a while now, and, and I'm just excited to, to add some value as, kind of as a team here. So this is super fun. Awesome. Yeah, let me introduce Timothy Morgan to you guys. I've uh, been getting to know him for, well, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine months, something like that. And um, the months keep adding up. But um, Timothy is truly serious about giving. Um, and I have really received from him a lot. I've loved learning, be, being his coach, uh, his coaching client. Um, man, I can't talk right now. I have really enjoyed um, learning from him about how to brand myself better, how to be more visible, how to promote myself. And he's been helping me increase my confidence and, um, and a lot of things in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know that we would have 44 guys on this call without Timothy and his team. He's got some real genius there um, that is, you know, I developed the expertise on the other side and he's got this stuff like nailed down really well. And, but, but I'll tell you one thing that I like the most about Timothy Morgan is he is serious about getting it right with his family. And I really respect that. I really love that about him. So Timothy, it's, it's really awesome to be your colleague and working here with you today. Give Thanks for the kind words, the Adam. Goods, I really appreciate you. Bring your best A game. Give here us the go. good stuff. Here we go. I'm gonna, we're going to give you the good stuff. This is, this is a signature process that was developed over years and years and years, working with thousands of organizations. And so you want to take really Really, really good notes as you have been uh, because these four pieces are the key, the keys, the four spiritual laws of marketing are coming your way. So these are the keys to make sure that you're the top, you know, five, 10% of your industry, like you're the top echelon, you know, piece of your part of your industry. This is what separates the big boys and girls from those who are just entrepreneurs. They're, they're the folks that, you know, that are really hitting it hard and very serious about their business. So but what we noticed is that folks that put these four pieces in place were generating double, triple revenue of those that were not. So this is a very, very important. We have some uh, kind words that are online. You can Google Giver Marketing, Giver Marketing Network, and you'll see folks saying about how their appointments just shot through the roof or tripled their business with very little expense. Uh, we're, we're a big on organic and low cost marketing efforts just because we want to serve that small business uh, uh, community, uh, coaches, consultants, advisors, uh, mentors, community leaders. We love it. We just love organizations that are doing good in the world. So we, we like to follow folks like Bob Burke. He was an influence on the naming of our company, him along with Adam Grant. Those are two names you probably want to write down, Bob Burke and Adam Grant, they have some extraordinary uh, resources. They're very different people. One's like super, you know, super young, like 40 under 40 kind of person, entrepreneur. Uh, Bob Berg is like an OG of relationship, sales and marketing. And we're talking about marketing, not sales today, but ultimately we lead with coaching because of some of the training that we've received from, from people like Adam Fleming. And we're excited to be able to draw out your potential even today with some good training that could lead to coaching. Okay, let's be clear. This is not a, a, a coaching session per se, one-on-one. -on -one. It's more of a group environment where, where we might be asking questions. We might be challenging you to do some things. So there might be some, some pieces of coaching built into this group training, but it, it's ultimately our privilege to be able to draw out your genius. Okay, and by the way, Adam, Adam and I have talked about these kind of things before, but coaching produces 529% more 
ROI, according to Pyramid Resource Group, than if you were to do it alone. So you're in the right place. Like, I just want to encourage you that this marketing blueprint you're about to see will generate more appointments, attention, conversations, all the good, good um, communication efforts that you do will, will, will be targeted toward your audience, obviously, and hopefully the quality of those conversations will continue to increase. Hey, I want to give you a little reward for paying attention. Uh, not everybody pays attention for two hours straight. If you're here and you're paying attention, you need to be rewarded. I mean, can I hear an amen? You need to be rewarded, right? So here, here's what we're going to do. If you pay really close attention and do these four action assignments, you are on your way to receiving what we call the Marketing Accelerator Package. Now, there are three additional action assignments that we won't be covering today, but I'll show you how to do that, okay? So you're going to you're gonna cross, you're going to run more than half of the marathon here by, by executing on four assignments. Pay really close attention, and then we'll give you the other three later, and then you're going to get yourself a $1,500 Real value. This is literally what we charge clients. You're literally going to get it just for executing. Everybody gets it if they pay attention. Okay. So here we go. All right. Oh, and by the way, uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, you're already in our private group. But if you're not, if you're here live or watching on YouTube or some other place, then you want to go to givermarketing.com slash group. Stacy's going to put that in the chat box and it's going to end up in some other places too. But ultimately, you want to pay attention to that because that's how you're going to get your reward. Okay. All right. So I told you that this, this process, this signature process, which, by the way, uh, Adam and I are collaborating on some things. We're, writing a, we're uh, writing a book around these principles that you're about to see. So uh, soon to be a bestseller. Here we go. Um, <laughs> branding, visibility, promotion, and nurturing are the pieces. This is the blueprint in one slide. Okay. So if, if, if we could all agree on these four words, then I could just be done right now. But many of us have different definitions of these words. So as a good coach and trainer, I wanna be able to dig deep with you on these. Your action assignments, your micro assignments, they take about a minute and a half each, okay? It's gonna follow that track. One assignment for branding, one for visibility, one for promotion, and one for nurturing, okay? These are the action assignments. If you want to take a screenshot, you're welcome to do that. You, have, you can also reach out to Stacy Stockford or ask in the private group, which is where the arrow is pointing at the bottom of your screen. Okay, clear? Any questions on that? You can light Stacy Stockford up. Yes, you're welcome, Stacy. <laughs> All right, marketing defined. Marketing is not the same as sales. Can we say, can we say that out loud even if we're on mute? Marketing, Marketing is, not is not the, the same, same as, sales. as sales. Thank you. Large corporations understand this. Smaller organizations do not generally. That's why we have to be very clear in our training that I'm not a sales trainer. I might be assertive and outgoing and all that with personality and all that good thing, like, but I'm not a sales trainer. There's very few circumstances. Sometimes with our own internal team, I'll do some, but I, I am not a paid sales trainer, okay? But I will say this, marketing is pre-sales communication. So if you know what you're selling, you should be able to reverse engineer that and front load the communication with good marketing so that your sales process is smooth as butter very smooth like it shouldn't be a forced effort at all right so here's how here's how you know whether you're in a marketing funnel or a sales funnel if you're thinking okay this is a conversation an engagement an appointment um i'm, I'm tracking people's attention i'm tracking their 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 micro actions that's all marketing if they hit the pay button and they're asking buying questions about how much it costs or what the commitment level is, you are in a sales funnel. You're in, a, in the sales process. We call them decision-making meetings. We don't even call them sales meetings really. But you, if they're asking buying or decision questions about commitment or cost, you are in a transactional piece of the conversation. 
That's when you've dropped from marketing to sales. If you don't know when that changes, then you need to step back and look at your own process. Okay. That's what, that's all I'm going to say about that. But we are going to be talking about only the marketing funnel at the top here. Okay. You got to be responsible for your sales. We're responsible for helping you get some marketing and some attention and some good conversations going. All right. So with that being said, prospecting technically is what? Marketing or sales? Put it in the chat box. Is prospecting marketing or sales? And yes, the answer is on the screen. Is prospecting technically marketing or sales? Good. Timothy, I, I've seen people treat it like it's sales and it's usually pretty awkward. I'm like, I don't even know who you are. Right? I, it's awkward's a, a nice way to put it. I mean, we're 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 allergic to spam around here, right, Adam? Like, mm -hmm. like even the folks that like that are here today, like we're we're friends, like we want to help you. Like we we're here to give value. We're not, I'm not, we're not pitching you a bunch of things on this. This is not a webinar, this is a master class. Like it's very different. People pay hundreds and even thousands of dollars for this. And you're here and you're paying attention. So we wanna we wanna make it clear that we're even how how we got to the same room together was not spammy, right? I mean, you might got an email reminder and some couple of different things, but that's about it. Like, we're not sitting here trying to force you to, you know, pay now, pay now, pay now, upsell, upsell. Like, we just, we're just not into that. Like, that's not how we do it. So I'm just, that's a personality thing. That's a preference thing. But here, here's the deal. Marketing gets you to the red zone. Sales gets you to the end zone. I learned from Adam and a few others to use imagery and analogies so that people can remember the difference and when the transition is. You're going... Tim, why are you talking about so Timothy? Why are you saying so many different things about marketing versus sales? Well, it's because we get confused. We 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 get back asked. We're we're starting with sales and then we try to do a little bit of marketing after after we try to pitch somebody. And that's not the way you do it. That's not that's not mature business. Want to know why companies stay really small? It's because of the, what I just told you about marketing and sales. It's one of the keys, not the only one. There's processes and procedures and goals and all the. Those are very important. But if you start treating conversations like a sales pitch too early, you will keep your organization small. Okay, branding. Let's jump right into it. This is the blueprint. Here we go. Branding is number one. Write it down. Branding. Branding represents the sum total of these experiences that we find when we interact with somebody, okay? The best definition of branding I've seen in decades of working in one way, shape, or form with marketing professionals is by Michelle Van Otten. In fact, Stacy, we should we should invite Michelle to do do, uh, do some work together because uh, we we're connected on social media. I just I've talked to her a little bit a little bit here and there, but she is amazing when it comes to this actual definition. It's the best I've seen. So I would screenshot this or remember it or write some keywords around it. Okay, here's the bottom line: If marketing is communication, your brand is really how you, how people feel when they experience you. Um, we'll, we'll talk real quickly about the five senses in just a minute, but you also want to know who is your who. And it's a funny little phrase we picked up from, at, um, who was that? Pedro Adayo. Pedro Adayo is another good voice in the space. And we don't, we don't you can tell by now, I, I love spreading the wealth and letting people know about other resources. Like we're not a, this is not a proprietary concept. Like this is, all this is, is gold sitting right in your, your pocket, ready to take, right? So who is your who? It's not just a target audience. It's who you're called to. It's, it's, it's how, how you, who you're pulled to. Like who, who, you, who do you find the most satisfaction from serving? That, that's who you're, people often ask, who's my target audience? Well, tell me about three of your favorite clients. Whether, whether they paid you full price or not, that's not the point. The point is, who are, who are your favorite ones? That's a great way to kind of ask yourself about your target audience or who is your who. Uh, this is a personality assessment for your brand. In one slide, <laughs> on one page. Like you don't even have to answer but one question. Which one of these is your strength? Put it in the chat box. Which one of these is your strength? And it could change in three years from now. Maybe it won't be your strength in three years, but generally it stays pretty consistent. 
it usually stays in the top one or two, right? So, so give yourself kind of a quick self-evaluation, which one of these is your strength? Lots of creativity in the room. Ooh, well, that's good to know. I like it. Yeah, um, a, lot of, a lot of folks that consider themselves like uh, coaches, consultants, advisors, community leaders have way more creativity than their brand reflects. They are actually very creative. And so we need to let that come out, right? So that's part of what we do. Hey, uh, we're designed, God designed us to experience keyword experience, each other and companies and organizations through the five senses. If we can evaluate how well we're doing in these five areas, just anecdotally even, like how well are we doing with the sight and sound side of things? That's basically video, right? How well are we doing it? Jumping on and doing videos and things like this. Stacy's been doing videos. Adam's been doing videos. We're, we're all like trying to get more and more and more into video because it's the communication preferred method of consumption right now okay smell taste and touch when you're in the room like evaluate are you bringing your a plus brand to the room uh, a lot of times it's just as simple like did you know that if you if you have a mint or give somebody a mint they're likely to have an exponentially higher retention and memory of that conversation you're about to have just little things, like little tiny, like here's a, here's a mint. I'm going to have one too. Like, let's have a conversation. The retention on that is higher. Look it up. The five senses are a big, big deal. I mean, just look at Disneyland. It's almost like sensory overload really at that point. But if you can, if you can create a rhythm where the senses are engaged properly, then you're going to have a lot more attention than if you did not. And that's a big part of your brain. Okay, so video is, we already mentioned video and your micro assignment is gonna be around video. Don't get scared, just get bold. But your micro assignment is gonna be about sharing your one minute origin story. But video is up to 50 times more effective. I mean, let me ask you this. If we were doing a podcast right now and everybody was listening in, would that be as effective as if we were doing a masterclass on Zoom? Auditory only is, is, is a fraction of the impact of video is visual and auditory. So let's leverage it. I know we're all zoomed out because of this, that, or another thing, but get used to it. Monitor it. Have somebody help you with your rhythms so that you can engage fully with Zoom. Don't complain about Zoom. Uh, put boundaries around when you engage with Zoom and how you record and who you talk to and how many people you talk to and all that. So uh, we want to encourage you that video is the game. It is the game. And I, Timothy, just had my I, I don't know much about all this yet. I'm still learning so much from you, but there is no question that Zoom and video are not going away. Right? I mean, you can, yeah, it's just like any other innovation. You can complain about it or you can leverage it for good. It's up to you. Like It's, it's like it's, saying it's, you don't like money, you know, because <laughs> okay. you rather go back to barter system or something. Okay. And back right. in the that'll work. Back in the prehistoric prehistoric days. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, um, I just, just reframing first, it a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, I like it. No, I like it. I had my first three three D virtual meeting with multi million dollar like cutting edge, comp, bo like boardroom meeting, a few like a month ago, and so the, if if we don't catch the video wave, we're going to be so far behind. We, we won't even like, we won't even have know how to have a norm, like a typical meeting in five years. So this is not a, a choice anymore. Like yeah, you, ha you have to understand the art of video. Okay. All right, good. And I know I'm preaching. I get it. I know I'll, em I'll embrace it. But so there's some things that you, it, it would be um, disingenuous for me not to just push. Like to me, video is one of those things. Okay. What's authority branding, Adam? What? How do you how would how would you describe authority brand? Oh, you're asking me. Oh, wow. yeah, put me on the spot. Yeah, let's go. Um, well, it's that ex you know if you go back to the idea of your brand is the, the sum total of the experience in the marketplace is how many people in your marketplace have experienced you as an authority. How's that for an answer? 
that works. Hey, you and I are in a, in a, in a room together trying to bring some value and some love to an audience, right? Sure. It's more than an audience. These are our friends and our associates, right? So mm-hmm. there's an authority that comes with you and me being in the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm leveraging on your authority. You're leveraging on my authority. We're bringing like Uber value, right? This is like podcasting 101. This is like co masterclass <laughs> 101. Like this is what you do. So yeah. if you can find people in your space that are power partners, we were just consulting somebody earlier today. Power partners is so exponentially beneficial for your brand that if you don't, if you don't consider it, you'll, you'll lose some authority in the marketplace. So we want to get you to that place where you're rubbing shoulders, having conversations, even on social media, just going back and forth with people that you respect that are really good at what they do. Do not be insecure to the point to where you don't hang with professionals who are ahead of you. Crush the insecurity and go into authority branding. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Can I hear an amen? Awesome. 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 All right. Here's the bottom line for branding. Here's the action assignment. Here's what you want to, if you don't remember anything else than this, when it comes to branding, all the other pieces are really good, kind of peripheral, but this is the core of your brand. If people know where you came from and why you do what you do, they are like 10 times more likely to work with you, right? I mean, Adam, if you and I like just didn't connect, like our stories didn't like, didn't really align, values are like way different, like we just yeah. didn't really like each other, Right. Would we even be here today? Like, come on. If I didn't like you, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah for sure. Not. So how do you, how do you know if your audience, how do you know if you're attracting and magnetizing the right conversations by telling your story? So I'm not talking about story brand. That's a whole like business, like strategy, like high level. That's a, it's really good. This is the pre story. This is the origin story. This is the, the, the background story. This is the elevator story. When you only have one minute to uh, share something before a keynote talk or anything like that, I'll, I'll tell you mine. I was in the nonprofit space, community leader space for years and ended up also buying, building, selling small businesses. And I just found it really, I was super frustrated. I kind of had this like aha moment that it's really hard to work with marketing professionals who know what they're doing and they'll stick around for a while and charge a fair price. So now I feel called to help organizations, causes, companies, community leaders who are doing good in the world by getting the word out, uh, leveraging the company that we started, which basically is an organization of marketing specialists who eliminate the, the high cost of agencies. So we're a a tribe of marketing specialists that, that help causes and companies doing good in the world. That's what we do. So that's my, my origin story as it relates to my company. That I just did my own micro assignment. Like that's it, right? All right, good. So that's an example. If you need to uh, look, at, look at an example, just rewind the, the video and there's your example, okay? This is your micro assignment. And it's your only differentiator in your company. Unless you have proprietary technology or, or intellectual property that is outrageously complex, your origin story is the only differentiator in your small business or organization. And this includes churches, non-pro- nonprofits, small businesses. Your origin story is so stinking powerful. If you don't tell it, you're literally hiding your light. You're hiding your, your genius, okay? You're, you're not giving people a chance to emotionally connect with you. Unless you're selling $3 widget, I recommend telling your story. Very, very powerful. Okay. All right. So post your one minute origin story in the private group page. Is everybody clear where this private, this, this private group page is and how to get there? Are we all clear? Give me a yes in the chat box if you know where we're going here. Like where you're going to end up landing after you know during and after our our time today right okay all right good 
And Stacy's putting some of that in the chat box and all that too. Visibility is piece number two. Can everybody hear me okay? Are we good on bandwidth and everything going good? Hearing you good. good. Visibility is piece number two. It's important to note that if you're not branded at least to an acceptable level, we do not give permission for you to go public. Visibility is counterproductive if your brand stinks. It actually does more harm than good. We've actually had clients we've recommended they take down their website and social media pages because they're not ready for visibility. They're not ready to be seen. They're not ready to be found. But we can help them, you know, ramp it up super fast. It's just the point, the point is, is you got to do branding first before you do visibility. Okay. In a perfect world, this is the order in which everything is done marketing wise. Okay. So a good exercise is to search for yourself online. If you want to learn more about how to do that, talk to Stacy. We have a team member that walks people through how to do that. Okay. Just looking for yourself online without cheating, uh, using an incognito mode to, to kind of give you a cleaner result. And if, and if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out or ask questions later, okay? Uh, website is your, your digital real estate you own. And all these other platforms that are on the screen are definitely worth considering depending on your industry. And they do help increase your visibility organically and without cost. Uh, Google My Business, for example, is probably worth I don't know, probably worth about 50 to 100 grand to our company, and it's free. And we're, we're a boutique agency. Like, we only have 20 team members. When we have 100 team members, that, that, that Google My Business page is probably going to be worth half a million dollars. Just because of the, the traffic and just the visibility it brings to our company. Okay. And it's free. You just have to. Go uh, register for it. Google My Business is a great first step. Okay. A directory tool that we offer to folks who are part of this training is found at givermarketing.com slash visibility. This will help you know where you actually are listed correctly online. It's a tool. It's an algorithmic tool, essentially, that helps you find yourself online from a um, technical standpoint. Okay. And because nine out of 10 people or more are going online before buying anything from you, we got to make sure you look uh, legit and you're found online easily and quickly. It's all part of the experience, right? So you want to go to givermarketing.com slash visibility, and it'll spit out a report. And what you're trying to do is look, you're, you're trying for a zero error rate on that exercise. And by the way, this is the micro assignment. So I hope by now you've written down or you've copied, or uh, if you want to, you can copy the entire chat log by clicking on the three dots in the lower right corner. And uh, that should help you keep track of these links as well. All right. So let's talk about reviews. There's a lot of debate about, you know, should I pay for reviews? Should I just have, you know, friends and family, a few, a few good reviews? Is that enough? There's a lot of questions about this. Here's the bottom line. Get as many as, as you can, dozens and dozens and dozens at least, if not hundreds, but dozens at least, to get to the point where you look credible and you're not a brand new business or you're a business that doesn't know what they're doing, <laughs> right? So we want dozens of kind words out there on Google specifically. And if you go to givermarketing.com slash gbox, there's another free tool for you to be able to learn how to generate uh, a link that's easy to send to clients, customers, friends, family, neighbors, and get you. I think we just broke 100 five-star reviews. We're the highest rated review network of marketing specialists on the planet because of this tool. It's just because we asked people to say some kind words that we worked with and they said, okay. It's, and by the way, use the term kind words. Don't use the term review, even though that's technically what it is. Little tip, 
but super important if you want to stay highly rated because there's those personality types out there that are always trying to give you some negative feedback, right? It's just, a, it's a personality type. It's not, there's nothing wrong with some of these people. They just, they find it their job to give you the negative review out of like, you know, 50 others. And it's like their job to do that. So um, encourage them to give you some kind words and that should help. People want to know what you do well at anyway. They don't care about everything, you know, everything else. They want to know what your genius is anyway. So just encourage them to talk about that. Visibility. Uh, we, if we have more time, we'd go into this, but Look, if you have a physical location that you meet people at, just make sure they can find it. It seems like common sense, right? But it's not so common. Like make sure that your Google Maps and your signage and even, even the, the lettering on like your vehicle, if you're parking in a parking lot every day or whatever, like make sure that it's pretty clear like where you're at, right? Uh, I don't know how many times I've tried to go meet with either a potential client or a power partner or something and like the address they gave me is like on the whole other side of the street or something where they really are. And it's like, it's super frustrating. So let's keep that in mind when, when it comes to just physically being able to find somebody too. Right. All right. So one of the things is we're not just a digital agency. We're digitally heavy because the world is digitally heavy, but we're well-rounded in how we look at this. Stacy, you had something to add or question? Yes. Yeah, so we got a question coming in from Shirley. What uh -huh. if you don't have a physical location? Oh, great question. Um, if you don't have a physical location, I still, we, we still recommend, and I, if Vicki, Vicki Christensen, if you're on this training, please let Stacy know. I just want to make sure uh, that we include you uh, on that. Um, but when it comes to visibility, we have a gal named Visibility Vicki. She's amazing. And she, she answers a lot of these questions in more depth. But here's the short answer that I've heard from Vicki. If you can find a, some kind of either address that you can partner with somebody on, like maybe a friend owns a, a shared space somewhere in town, try to, try to ask permission to utilize that, like, that space for your Google My Business listing if you can. It could be as simple as just adding a suite number at the end of an address. Uh, we do not recommend using your home address um, unless you have like a high level of confidence, nobody's gonna bother you there. But I, I, in general, I just don't, I just don't recommend that. There's, the world's too weird, right? So grab a physical address either at a friend's company if you don't have one or in some cases, Google's been a little bit more of a stickler on this, but in some cases, you can try to get a virtual address from one of these companies for like five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month or whatever it is. It might work. You can give it a shot. And that'll give you a Google My Business listing without your own physical address. Does that make sense? Stacy? did I do okay on that? Yeah, you did. There's another one here. Um saying people are popping and saying use a UPS store address. Yeah, UPS store is, is good. We have some clients that have done that. Um, again, Google is starting to crack. I, we have some clients using the actual United States Postal Service PO box that they now give you a physical address when you get a PO box. So it's the same, it's a similar thing as the UPS store, right? So there's like five, four or five different ways to kind of work around the system if you don't have a physical address. That's, that's the bottom line, right? But there's ways. You could try, you know, try two or three different ways and see which one sticks. The main thing is you want your listing on Google to be legit and, and to be something that's fairly consistent. And then if somebody shows, you know, somebody wants to reach out to you that you look reputable, okay? Do the best you can with that. Our micro assignment is to go ahead and post your visibility report, a screenshot or a link will work in the private Facebook group. And if you're not already a member, uh, Stacy will let you into that private group, okay? It is an invite only private group, so it's, it's not for everybody. All right, promotion, piece number three. Great questions, by the way, keep them coming and Stacy will We'll get them uh, toward the end of our session, okay? 
promotion matters. We're big fans of promotion. We just don't think that's where you start. You start with branding, then you go to visibility, then you earn the right to promote. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Can you give me like a thumbs up or like we start with the foundations before we start advertising or promoting, okay? But when we do put an ad together of any kind, whether it's an organic or paid ad, we, we advertisement or promotion, we wanna include three pieces for sure, every time. You want to inform well with good information, give a call to action and engage with dialogue if at all possible, as quickly as you can. There, this is the, actually, this is the reason we're all here today. This right here, this slide because we did this fairly well with, by the way, I don't mind saying it, little to no ad budget. You can do this organically. Like you, the idea that you have to pay Facebook $5,000 to get 15 people to show up to a room is ridiculous. Doesn't make sense. You can do this yourself, okay? Stacy, you had another possible question. Did I see that or what, are we? Okay, we're good, all right. Cool, I'm gonna keep cruising. And by the way, we're not talking about being spammy here or cheesy or bait and switch, none of that, okay? We're just talking about informing an audience with the truth of who you are so that you can magnetize the right people. Create awareness. Do not be the best kept secret in town. That's all we're asking here, okay? Or in your region or in your space or however you wanna think about it. Just don't be the best kept secret, okay? Call to action is not buy this big, you know, my largest package right now. That's not what call to action is. Call to action can be as something as simple as, hey, it might be a good idea to set up a phone call with Adam Fleming. Here's his calendar link. By the way, he doesn't give that calendar link to everybody. You got it because you're here, right? I like that, Timothy. That's like a good call to action. Pull that together. Okay, good. Yeah. We like to have you got to have fun and we got to really care about people if we're going to be in this business, right? So simple, clear, no low cost type of call to action is just fine. We don't need, I mean, I don't mind charging somebody a couple dollars just to have their card on file so we can do more work together in the future and make it easy. That's, that's more of a benefit to the client, honestly. But, but the low, no cost stuff is a great way, place to start, just to start that trust building relationship. And look, I gotta be a human. I gotta engage. Like, how? Tell me in the chat box how many how many people got a message from me, Stacy, or Adam that remind kind of reminded you, or, or or the dialogue was there for you to show up today. Just just say yes or no. Did you get a message from me, Stacy, or Adam to show up today? as a form of dialogue, like in, in engaging conversation. Give me a yes in the chat box if that was, and Stacy's like dopamine uh, receptors are just going all over the place. Cause like, this is her superpower. She loves to coordinate conversations and engagements, right? So yeah, a little shout out for Stacy for sure. Okay, don't gamble, measure your results. Start with your goal in mind, then work backwards, right, Nancy? Start with your goal in mind and work backwards. That goes for anything. All right, so we do, did we say track everything? Did we, did we mention that? Like, if something's important, it's worth writing down and tracking. If it's not important, just, just be random. Just throw whatever against the wall. Just, just gamble. No, we don't, we don't mind experimentation, but we're going to track it. So that the next time it's a more intelligent experimentation. So there is experimentation, but goodness gracious, be, in, be intentional about it. Like know what's working. If something's working, one of our favorite coaching questions, thanks to you know Adam and others, is what's working well for you in your marketing right now? You know what? Put it in the chat box. Tell everybody what's working as far as promotion and marketing in 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 the chat box, to tell us in one sentence or less, what is working well for you in your marketing right now? Adam's gonna be like hanging out with Timothy Morgan and the tribe. No, I'm just kidding. But 
you know what I mean? Like, like what tactic, what method, what approach, what get any, any one sentence answer is fine. It'd be kind of interesting. It's almost like a little survey, right? This will help everybody too. Here's some ideas, referrals, events, print, online, radio, television. Like these are some concepts of, uh, or categories of promotional efforts. So which, which, which one of these maybe even are working well for you? Almost every company that I know of loves referrals. If they don't, they're probably in some weird industry I don't even know about. But if, if, if you're in business, you probably like referrals, even nonprofits. Like we love referrals to people who are going to donate and participate and all this, right? So referrals are the lifeblood of almost every organization I've been involved with. So you want a system around that. You want to literally be able to track it, expect it, and know what to expect for future. Like right now, we're on pace to have about 50 introductions slash referrals every month. And we can, we can tell you about all that training and how to do that later. But the point is, is we know what to expect. We have Trello boards and we have spreadsheets and we have appointment calendars to be able to give a good ballpark of how to track those referrals. To us, referrals are it. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the bomb, right? And we want to we want to put some a lot of our you know time business activity into that kind of thing. And when it comes right down to it, we want to put a budget toward it too, right? Good. So we got events, print. Timothy, real quick, what yep. would be one or two things that you would spend money on to get more referrals? Reward program. Okay, great. Um, Stacy, you have any other ideas on that? I mean. There's a bunch of them, but I mean, I like to, what, what are you thinking? Sorry, can you say that again, Adam? I'm reading, I'm keeping up with the chat oh, here. I just the, the, the last, the last slide, slide spend said, spend at least 10% of your marketing budget on referrals. And I asked, what would you spend money on to get more referrals? And he said, um, uh, loyalty programs, things like that. Loyalty programs. Um, if you're unable to run your own social media, invest in having someone run it for you. Because if you're missing out on um, replying to comments, posting, you know, sharing other people's posts, there's so many strategies on social media that mm -hmm. if you're missing out those things, that's really important. And Connecting through LinkedIn, connecting with people. That's why I'm encouraging everyone that's on this call today, drop your LinkedIn, make sure we're connecting and take a few minutes and meet each other after. You never know where that one 10 minute conversation will go. Or yeah, it's just interesting to hear your idea there on what, what fits in that marketing budget bucket of referrals and you're including um, paying someone to manage your social media. So that's an interesting thing to be putting in the bucket that I had not heard before. Thanks. Yeah, I, I really do think it's a good thing to do. I've And finding someone that's, um, that has a passion for it, you need to have a passion for it before. It's not just everyone can do this. Definitely. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is uh, you could include some of your, like there's certain software that helps with generating more referrals. I would actually put LinkedIn as a software cost for generating referrals because we do something called referral ping pong and it's just absolutely game changer for our company. Um, rewards for those referrals are built into referral ping pong. That, that's part of the whole deal. You could pay for those in cash or you can pay for them in like credits with your company or exchanges of value of some kind. So, so that I, and Stacy, when you're saying social media, you're talking about when it comes to referrals, it's mostly outreach, like private message and direct message campaigns that is asking people for some level of exchange or referral or introduction or something like that, right? Yes, yes, good. exactly. Okay, cool. Awesome, so those are some good ideas. Great question, Adam, thank you. Events, I mean, we're on, a, we're on an online event right now. We're live and having some fun and going, you know, we're all over the place. So this is super fun to be able to be here together. Um, physical, you know, physically being in the room together. I, I look forward to more and more and more of those along the, as the years go on in just different ways. Um, print. I love bringing up Chick-fil-A. If, if it, just if for nothing else, just to 
just to think about their chicken sandwich. But listen, uh, they do something in print that I don't know that any other company has done with this such, such success. They increase their foot traffic in their physical locations by 25% using a little cow appreciation day where you put like a piece of paper on your, uh, on your clothing and you pretend like you're a cow and they have it on billboards and they have it all over the place. They're one of the best at leveraging print medium. In other words, not, not digital. They do a little bit of digital now to complement this, but that's mostly social media. Promotion, we can talk about this for an hour. Um, just, just hit us up if you need any questions about uh, how to dig into more online um, strategies, kind of digital ads and those kind of things. We've increased call volume on, with one company by over a thousand, leveraging digital ads. Others, we just <laughs> lit up their calendar with LinkedIn. Uh, there's just, there's different Facebook ads. Like, th these things are becoming more common now. And so in certain circumstances, it's good to be able to put some time and, and even resource, other resources into that. Radio and podcasting is super fun if you're that kind of personality. Here's what I'll say. If you don't like being on the spot, um, answering questions on the fly, um, get, uh, kind of bring a lot of energy to a room. If you're not that person, then don't try to be that person. Like just be you. So if radio and podcasting isn't your game, then play another game. That's not the only way to promote yourself, right? I'm, I mean, we're giving you an acrostic right now with like, I don't know, five or six or seven different ways to promote yourself. Television's another one. Like some people have a, a radio face. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like do what you do you, like do what you enjoy, do what you're confident in. And the only thing we ask for, as far as a micro assignment, this, this literally takes 30 seconds. Um, grab some kind of digital screenshot or ad or a business card that you created or something that you've, you've put out there as a promotion to either digital or print and screenshot it and pop it into the group and we'll give you some feedback on it. I've had people post radio interviews, radio commercials, like all sorts of stuff, to, you know, YouTube videos that they've done that are a little bit more on the promotion side, like anything with some kind of contact information or offer and it will count as a promotional piece okay organic paid doesn't matter as long as we know that it was some kind of like hey hire us or hey contact us anything with a call to action of any kind is uh, or or contact information is fine screenshot that pop it in the group and we'll give you credit for that last piece how are we doing on time stacy got to give me the oh boy here we go all right Engaging prospects with continued intentional conversations. This is nurturing. Some people call it follow-up system. And this is where the gold is. I mean, 1% of people are generally ready to buy your stuff right now. So if you have 100 conversations, you'll probably have one or two people that are like, hey, I'll, I'll buy that right now. With a good nurturing system, it jumps to 15% in some, with some stats I've seen, okay? So you literally will 10x your results if you follow, pay attention to this piece right here. If you do it well, it'll, it'll produce a lot of revenue, okay? Again, 80% uh, of like these decision appointments occur after a minimum you know, amount of interactions. So we wanna see at least five to seven interactions. So we're gonna show you seven really quick. The introduction is your first impression. That's your first interaction. Don't sell anything. Tell your origin story if you can and get contact information. You are not in a hurry. Unless they're in a hurry, you're not in a hurry. Does that make sense? You are the professional. You're the expert. You are not, you do not have sales breath. You are not desperate. You're in a place of abundance. I feel like I'm going to preach a sermon right now. I don't know. Okay. Number two, brief email. Great connecting. Ask a question. Easy call to action. Oh, don't overlook that. Second bullet point, ask a question every time you send an email if you could, if you could possibly do it because it incre increases what? Dialogue, right, Stacy? You are the masterette at dialogue. And this right here, asking a question. If your email doesn't end in a question mark or have a significant question mark somewhere in that email, you're probably leaving money on the table because you're not encouraging dialogue. 
Yeah. All right. All right. Give me a name. Yeah, because and because marketing is conversations. It's not sales. It's different. Yeah, I mean, we're not there yet. Like if somebody's literally asking, "Hey, email me back your payment link so that I can pay," because I'm so excited to work with you. That's different. Send them an email with a payment link. I still might ask them a question, like, "Hey, pay here." Um, when would be best for us to connect next week or the week after? I still would ask a question and it's still a sales email. Like, mm -hmm. like do the best you can to put a question mark somewhere in your email, even if it's a PS. Okay. Uh, actually PS is really powerful with a question. Social. It's like that Columbo thing, right, Adam? Social, <laughs> right. So, social media. Uh, talk to some of our team members about that. It's just, you just got to be active. Okay. And that's another way to have a little impression, a little touch, a little follow-up. Give something they value. I just sent somebody a, it was like a jar of peach jam. Because I heard him say, say something on a, like a podcast or something. And, I, and I, I'm connected with them and I want to work with them. And so I, I, just, I just wanted to bless them. It only costs like 10 bucks. It's not that big a deal. But if you really want to work with somebody... Find what they value. I just heard that they love, love, love peach jam. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to order it for them. Do stuff like that because it's, it's, you will stand out from everybody else. Other, uh, people don't, people hardly do that anymore. They don't bake cookies. They don't send stuff. They don't send gifts, handwritten letters. They don't do any of that stuff hardly anymore. So if you can do it, mm, you're going to be remembered. All right, physical gifts, recommendations or referrals, info and resources if they give you permission. Info and resources, you do not want to sp spam people with PDFs. They, they need to either, at, at least, you need to at least know they value it tremendously, at least that. But a lot of this is done with permission anyway. So invite people somewhere, see if they want to join a, our next masterclass. Uh, by the way, the Giver Marketing Network has another training on Tuesday. So uh, please, feel free to ask about that and we'll give you access to that because you're here today. Personal notes, uh, snail mail, text message, social media messaging, talk to Stacy about personal notes, direct messages, private messages. I think we booked what, a thousand appointments last year, Stacy, on my calendar using just personal notes. You're like, oh my God. I had almost uh, 1,200 appointments. I actually just this week looked at that. It was close oh. to 1,200 appointments. All right. Thanks yeah. for keeping track of the data. Goodness gracious. So listen, if, if, if an appointment's worth like 100 bucks to you as a company, do the math. We booked like $100,000 worth of appointments. I mean, depends on how much you're willing to pay for an appointment. But I mean, think about it. Like appointments, the holy grail of marketing, like that's what you want, right? So ask Stacy about that. She'll help you set up a system for that. Uh, phone calls. <laughs> I got a quick story and we're going to land this plane. Prepare great questions. Give two options. Do not leave voicemail. 10 years ago, yes, leave a voicemail. Today, no, Captain, do not leave voicemail. Now, if you have to, make it super short. Your name and your phone number twice. Seriously, like just keep it that short. The story I'm, <laughs> I wanted to share is I was training in an office of a $30 billion company. They had me come in and just teach them the art of conversation, specifically on LinkedIn. And, you know, Stacy's been helping with some of those kind of things. And uh, great, great response from one guy. He's like, yeah, when, uh, when we don't want people to call us back, we leave them a long voicemail. I'm like, dang, that is the truth. You leave me a long voicemail, you're probably not going to hear from me because that's a that's that's screaming waste of my time. Like they're going to just start. Now listen, if it's my mom or somebody like is really like older generation, and like I, I I know that they're not trying to monopolize my time. You know what I mean? If it's somebody like I know, that's different. But for 99.9% .9 of everybody else, if they leave me a long voice voicemail. They probably have sales breath and they probably have something going on where they're trying to pitch something. Okay. So let's get you to the green so you can put it in. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to be here to help you move at the speed of trust. Please ask for the sale, but 
only after you've done your due diligence on the marketing side and building that trust. And your last assignment, I know you've been waiting for it. You're salivating, you're hungry for it, you want it, you're thirsty. Uh, we want you to put in your follow-up system. If it's three, three action items, like, like three parts to your follow-up system, just put that. If it's five, put that. If it's you know much more than that and you have it written out somewhere, like I follow up people, I follow up, follow up in this way. I send an email, then I send a phone call, then, then I send them a text message, then I connect with them on social media or whatever you do. Try to put it in order, but we at least want to see your follow-up kind of like general rule of thumb, how you follow up with people uh, instinctively even, like just write it out. It's a good exercise to write it out even. And so we want you to post that and you can just type it right into a, a post right into the group and Stacy will make sure that she, she, you guys get credit for that. And again, here's your four assignments. If you want to screenshot it, and this is four out of the seven, you need to earn that $1,500 reward. So you're already over halfway there if you do these today or tomorrow, okay? So we want to encourage you to do that. Any questions around the micro assignments, the training? We're, we're at the top of the hour. So I, I do want to honor that, but you do have everything you need. So I just want to make sure that you have that. And again, Any this feedback is feedback in general. I'd love to hear what what uh, what you felt the experience was here today. That'd be awesome. Feedback or questions, anybody. And if you have to go, you have to go. I we, we get it. But if you want to hang out with awesome people like Stacy and Adam and myself, like let's yeah. Let's thanks for that. coming, everybody. Ask the question. Thank you so much. Yes. Stacy, any questions or comments coming in as we wrap up? Uh, no, just everyone saying thank you. Very inspiring. Um, it was very interesting. A short and sweet direct to the point. Carolyn um, L.R. Doucette said that. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you for the questions, yes. too. Lots of, yeah, it was a great session. We had, like, lots of nice feedback back and forth. It was awesome. Good. Um, we do have some more trainings available at no and low cost, so please let us know um, if you'd like more information. Reach out to us on LinkedIn. Adam Fleming, look him up. Myself, look me up. Stacy Stockford as well. But uh, we're glad to be able to coordinate uh, some kind of resources that you might need. And we're pretty low pressure. We're ju we just want to offer you value. And so if you have any questions, we can definitely answer those. Okay. God bless you guys. Anything else, Adam? Man, it was just a great two hours and um, thanks everybody so much for coming. Thank you, Timothy, for sharing all your stuff. It's awesome. You're really good at what you do. And um, I really appreciate working with you and I know other people will too. So yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Thanks everybody. Great. We'll see you in the Facebook group, the private group. Thank Talk you to guys. You okay, bye. You're welcome. Thanks bye. for joining. Take care, everybody.